Hey everyone, Georgie here with Ukraine Matters. What a week this was. A lot of events, a lot of positive news, and a lot of developments that we all have been waiting for. The things that we were hoping to start and be delivered and be happening on the front lines are actually happening so let's just jump straight in because there's a lot of things to cover we start with the direction of the main interest where ukraine is continuing their offensive uh, towards the city of tokmak i often say that ukraine needs to get tokmak what i mean obviously is that ukraine just needs to get to tokmak so it can physically cut off the road uh, Ukraine doesn't need to specifically take the city of Tokmak. But here we see developments that are really, really, really important. If you remember some three weeks ago, I told you that Russians have sent additional divisions, which were some people misunderstand and I thought that it was like some fresh divisions that are fully staffed, that has the full capacity in them. No, those were divisions of the airborne units, well not airborne, like VDV units uh, from Russia that were already in fighting, they were already reconstituted multiple times, their staff is not fully, they're roughly speaking 60% staff. So all in all, the main point here being that it was just additional reinforcements. And at that moment I told you that it either they're gonna come and they will have little to no impact and Ukraine will just roll over them because it was there was a certain momentum to Ukrainian actions or we will see them enter into fighting to then just receive the same treatment that all of the previous forces were in the area get attrited and then as they get their resources drained Ukraine will continue their advancement so what we're seeing right now that these units were concentrating on the flanks of Ukrainian offensive from the direction uh, from the right and from the direction from Kopany. On the right, I'm gonna move this map a little bit away. It's from the direction of Nova Fedorivka and Kopany. And for these two weeks, Russians have been intensively attacking Ukrainians, trying to close this pocket. And I was explaining to you that despite their best efforts, Ukrainians not only were able to hold their attacks, but they were able to set up multiple traps where a lot of the Russian forces were tra trapped in, where surprises were prepared, and all in all, Ukrainians were doing an amazing job. And finally, we are receiving, after three weeks, we are receiving first signs that these units that were sent there to reinforce Russian positions are now suffering the same attrition that all the previous units have been suffering before. There have been reports that Ukrainians are starting to gain grounds on their flanks, which means only one thing, that now Ukrainians are putting more pressure and attrited the, these units enough that they are now able not only defend against the attacks, but also counterattack and take the ground from there. Besides that, Ukrainians now have penetrated, and I'm going to turn on these uh, black lines. Like the black lines here are anti tank ditches, and I don't particularly like this map because it draws a false sense of understanding as of a person can look in this map, he can see the black lines and think, oh, this is where the Russian defenses are. Where in reality, a better option to look at is if you turn them off. And you can see these light uh, green lines on the map, which are the tree lines. And Russians actually have fortified positions of every single tree line in the area. So a better understanding of how Ukraine is advancing is just look at these tree line maps rather than um, looking at those black lines on the map because every tree line position needs to be cleared out. Every trench in those tree lines need to be taken. It's a very slow and tedious and hard work that costs a lot of Ukrainian lives as well. But these lines are what is referred to as the Suravikin, the first Suravikin line. It's a two anti-tank ditches with like a pyramids and minefields in between them. 
and before we had confirmations that Ukrainians have penetrated this line towards Verbove, but it was mostly light infantry that was there. Now, in the last couple of days, we have a full-blown confirmation that Ukraine is already using heavy equipment behind those two anti-tank ditches. That means that Ukrainians have established a proper, secure connection and a way to get across the equipment for through these anti-tank ditches. Therefore, we can say that this Suraviki first line is already penetrated in one of the area. Now it's about widening it because we hear a confirmation right now that south of, uh, not south, but uh, towards the east of Novoprokopivka, now Ukrainians have crossed again these double trench lines. So, and were able to cut the connecting road between Solotka, Balka and Verbove that was coming. It's, it's not there, but it's approximately the direction. So Ukrainians now are able, roughly speaking, after certain clearance to control this area. This is about 10 kilom or not 10, this is about six kilometers gap that Ukrainians will now control between these two trench lines. So Ukrainians will have the ability to establish proper crossing of these anti-tank ditches and they were able, will be able to get uh, and move their heavy equipment over there over time. A good way to think about this is just look at these two trenches and think about them as a sort of a river. So we need to get from one side of the river to the other and that's what Ukraine is doing. So they established the connection between two shores of the river and now they are getting to the other side. It's just a nice way of thinking about this. And besides that, now we can see that Ukrainians are also starting to gain certain ground on the sides. They will still need time to more diminish the capabilities of Russian forces. So I wouldn't expect some kind of major breakthrough or super fast developments. But again, maybe there will not be fast developments at all. We're going to talk about it at the end of the next week. But right now we hear about more positive developments from the area of Bakhmut. Here, Ukrainians and specifically Ukrainian um, intelligence chef were explaining the situation quite well. And this is exactly what I was explaining to you before, is that Ukrainians have dedicated a certain amount of forces here, but it's not a reinforced area by Ukrainians. So there are only the forces that they have dedicated before that are operating here and are able to draw and bind a lot of Russian resource in the area. And Ukrainians were able to liberate the settlement of Klishivka. They were able to uh, liberate the settlement of Andreevka, of Andreevka. And right now there are reports that Ukrainians are very close to liberating the settlement of Kurdjumivka. This will push Russian defensive positions closer to this uh, small river that it goes over here effectively allowing Ukrainians greater range of operations and allowing their artillery to move in closer to establish control against one of the major supply routes to Bakhmut from this, uh, from this highway. The main goal, as was underlined by Budanov, is for not for Ukrainians to directly take Bakhmut. This is for, to make sure that Russian forces are bound here, that Russia keeps uh, sending in troops because Bakhmut, Ukrainians are abusing the great um, mysterious fan fantastical aura that was given to Bakhmut because of how much resource, how many resources did Russia sacrifice in order to take it. It's not a strategically significant or operationally significant uh, settlement. It is not. But Russians are really willing to dedicate a lot of effort to keep holding it. And Ukrainians are happy to oblige and because they're having a favorable position on the heights right now. And it's just a big slaughterhouse for Russians. And recently I explained the situation which Russians at first denied, but finally even the ex-commander of that brigade confirmed it, that after the destruction of uh, remains of the Russian brigade in Andreevka that happened, I believe it was the 72nd brigade, Russians were faced with a huge gap inside of their defenses, which was terrifying for them. So they started pulling things 
from everywhere on the front line. And right now, for a longer time, we've been talking about Russians accumulating forces in the north. And to put it as an understanding, um, why is this is important? Um, war in a in a like a, in a larger sense is a sort of a boxing match. You should never, you cannot just win boxing match by just defending. Whenever you are defending, it's the the good kind of at least the Russian rule book. What it says is that you need to kind of defend with one hand and you need to strike with the other. So for them, having this northern grouping that is threatening Ukrainian positions is part of their playbook because they are not in a full defense. They're saying, yes, we are defending on the south, but we are preparing a major kind of second counterattack from the north. Therefore, it doesn't give a full initiative for your enemy. So coming back to this map and coming back to the situation of Bakhmut, we are now hearing that Russians are pulling in forces to reinforce Bakhmut area. And I've heard so far very, very limited rumors that there are consideration also to put additional forces in the southern area. This removes a lot of threat from the north. This obviously creates complications. And we, again, we're going to talk about the offensive very, very in details, specifically next week to evaluate it and think about perspectives. But what this does in a large sense is Russia absolutely, utterly giving away their initiative to Ukraine. So instead of being a competition of like a strike defense, strike defense back and forth, Russia more becomes like a fish on a grill. It's now Ukrainians that are would know that Russia is taking the forces that were supposed to be used for attack and they're being pulled away. Then it's now Ukrainians can decide, okay, now we're going to grill you this way or now we're going to grill you that way. It's now Ukrainian fully initiative without without thinking about, hey, we need to prepare for the counterattack. This is additionally underlined by Russians uh, dedicating their underprepared military uh, units that were supposed to enter service only in December this year. Instead, Russians have been sending these units to the front lines to help reinforce positions or prepare for offensive. Russians are burning through any kind of offensive capabilities that they're having. So in a large sense, is a strategic sense, it's an absolutely terrible position. This is the position that Ukraine was in when the war started, where Russia had all the capabilities and Ukrainians could defend and they did defend, but their defenses were always limited. And it was Russia that was decided, we're going to strike you here. We're going to strike you there. We're going to strike you everywhere. And it was awful time for Ukrainians to have. Now it's awful times for Russians to be in. And the problem of this position is that while maybe they can keep up and still try to delay Ukrainian advancements, they start, still try to delay, it slowly but surely gives away not just the initiative, but it gives away the ability to respond or threaten your in, in Russian case, the enemy, Ukrainians. So Ukrainians will have the full capability to dictate on what terms in war battles and where they will fight Russia. It's a devastating situation in a strategic sense. And the fact that we are in this situation where a year and a half ago, Ukraine was encircled from three quarters of their of their. Uh, land border, that they were attacked from every side and Russia had all the initiative. In just a year and a half, not only we've seen, roughly speaking, Ukrainian and Russian armies somewhat equalize, because right now we're assessing the situation as Ukrainian and Russian armies somewhat having similar capabilities, we are now seeing Russians completely giving way to Ukraine in all sense of strategic initiative. Important to understand here is that that doesn't mean that Russia is going to collapse. That doesn't mean that Russia 
is, is going to fall apart right away in the near future and so on. No, but in a big war sense, that is a devastating and pretty much a death sentence that is only bound by time with regards to Russia. It is awful. I cannot underline just how important it is that Russia loses any kind of counteroffensive initiative uh, from Ukrainians. And Ukrainians are not stopping there. Just recently, we got confirmations that Ukrainians will be getting additional capabilities with storm shadows being uh, deployed to Ukraine and potentially Germany also sending in Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Attackums missiles from US are there, there was, I was thinking in a yesterday's stream that it's going to be 140 mile missiles or kilometer missiles. I forgot exactly what it, which it was, but as more knowledgeable people were explaining that these missiles, they pretty much are non-existent and they're not being kept up. So most likely Ukraine will get 300 kilometer missiles. Unfortunately, it's going to be like a cluster missile, so it's not going to be single load. So they would not be able to use them to take out the Kerch bridge. But it would be an amazing capability to take out things like uh, uh, airfields, to take out other important uh, oil processing fact factories. It would be devastating for Russians. And it's already being devastating because last week I've explained a lot that Ukraine was having a dedicated campaign to make sure that anything that is to the west of Crimea would be absolutely blind zone for the Russians. They were taking radar installations out. They were taking forward facing positions out. They were taking the ships out that were sailing and checking the territory. And now all of that is paying off. We've seen strikes in Yevpatoria, Sevastopol, Simferopol. Ukraine is in a broad daylight bombing the Black Sea, sea uh, milit uh, Black Sea Fleet headquarters inside of the main city of Crimea. It is incredible. Watch Jake Bro, where he explains on American example how just ludicrously impossible that situation is. And this is, again, putting the same thing that I explained before. Ukraine is setting itself up to do anything that they want with Russia. They are setting Russia up to be a complete subsidiary to whatever Ukrainian desires they want. When I say that it's only going to get worse for Russia, I am not kidding. Attackums, 300 kilometer ballistic missile. A ballistic missile means that compared to uh, normal missiles like Storm Shadow or Scalp or Taurus that uh, Germany will provide, they are cruise missiles. So if this is land, then cruise missiles roughly fly kind of low uh, along the land shores. Those are when you see the videos when missiles just kind of fly along the land. A ballistic missile is the one that kind of goes up and then with huge speed, it drops down. Now, Atakams is a little bit smarter than that. It can maneuver and it can select different targets. But the point is that it gets really, really fast. It takes something like a Patriot missile system to take out to Patriot anti-air system to take, take out ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles have been a problem for Ukraine from what Russia has been sending. And now this is going to be a first precision ballistic missile that Ukraine is going to get. And it will be used to a devastating effect. We're going to see a lot of Russians stuff exploding, which is really, really, really nice news to hear. All in all, an amazingly good week. Obviously, Everything in this war doesn't come for free. It's paid by the deaths of Ukrainian heroes. We need to always remember that. But we are seeing Ukraine establishing an absolutely dominant position, even in a medium to long term in this war. It's devastating for Russian possibilities in this war. And the fact that Russians were so eager to try to fight this out, to have some kind of status quo, we're seeing that this is not happening. Zelensky came back from this whole visit to United States and Canada, and what he brought back, not only the goodies with the attackums and everything else and other packages of support, what we saw him bringing back is long-term commitments to support of Ukraine. It's 
extremely important that he did this extremely important and this will absolutely pave the way for absolute ukrainian victory i've never been more confident in that than it was after his visit right now it is great news but another great news is that we've started another uh, support campaign for the armed forces of ukraine remember while there is a lot of support for ukraine Ukrainian war is a large-scale conflict, a huge conflict. So there is not enough, always not enough support for anything. And Ukrainian armed forces need always more support. And we are again partnered up with uh, NAFO 69 Sniffing Brigade to gather enough uh, funds to get a truck to the medical unit of the 41st, uh, 41st Brigade to help them get the medical capabilities on the front line so please check out the link in the description i love you all guys slavo ukraini go check out the 69 sniffing brigade and i'll see you guys next time we are the 41st Me uh, detached mechanized brigade medical company we are in need of two 4x4 vehicles, one pickup truck and a jeep, which are necessary for evacuation and transportation of the wounded. We kindly ask Ukraine Matters and Charity Fund of the 69th Sniffen Brigade to help us upon this need. These vehicles are very urgent for us, especially now, because any wasted time means someone's life. Glory to Ukraine! Glory, Glory to the heroes! heroes.